So it's my pleasure to introduce Ahmed Almiri. And I think I've asked you how to pronounce your name enough times that it's unlikely to get any better. So <laughs> that's the best I can do. Um, but so Ahmed um, is uh, uh, originally from the city of Abu Dhabi um, and then did his undergraduate in Toronto, at the University of Toronto, and his PhD at, um, at UCSB in Santa Barbara. And while there, I uh, was one of the co authors of a very famous paper, the AA. AMPS paper, um, which is a, a paper that introduced the concept of firewalls. And uh, perhaps I'm not going to explain to us what those are, but it's a paradox associated with information paradox and black holes. And so the effect of that paper, which was very large, um, was to stimulate a burst of research on this old problem. Essentially, it made an old problem harder and more confusing than it used to be, um, and therefore more interesting. And since then, Ahmed has contributed to helping to solve that problem. Um, so he is currently a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study in, in Princeton, um, the recipient of the Breakthrough Prize, I believe, in 2021. The New Horizons. Oh, New Horizons Prize. New not Horizons not three Prize. million, just the <laughs> small one. <laughs> um, in 2021. And um, yeah, so, so he's going to tell us about decoding gravity. Thanks, Matt. So, thanks, Ahmed. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'll be right back. Should I begin or should I wait? Okay. Uh, All right, thanks, Max. Uh, thanks, Max, for the introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure for, for me to uh, give this colloquium amongst many friends and also family. Um, my talk today uh, will be on a subject that's very uh, near and dear to my heart, uh, namely gravity. Uh, and I'll talk, I'll talk about the, the, develop, the, the development or understanding of gravity and where it's going and give you a flavor of the tools that for some reason seem to work. And the fact that they do is nothing short of voodoo magic. We'll see that, oh, God. God. Oh, my computer froze, give me a sec. So there you go. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, oops. Sorry, I don't have the passcode. Um, or the local network? Yeah. Oh, no, for, for, for the Zoom meeting. Oh, right. Uh, okay. uh, I've got it. Are you ready? Yes, I am. Uh, 976 620 212. No, no, not the ID, the passcode. Oh, the passcode. So our uh, passcode is uh, 843838. Okay. Oops. Another video. And. Okay, good. Now it's working. So um, we'll see that gravity uh, knows things that it really ought uh, not to know. Uh, and I would say that we can't uh, say that we understand gravity until we know why it knows what it knows. Um, uh, so let me be the first to admit that I don't understand gravity. Maybe the better title for this talk is why I don't understand gravity. Um, and the place where I want to begin, uh, well, what I, what I want to begin with is why our progress on gravity has lagged uh, for so long. Uh, and so differently, I'll talk about the problem with gravity. The problem with gravity doesn't start with gravity, but it starts with local quantum field theory. Uh, after the revolutions of relativity and quantum mechanics of the, early, of the early 20th century, there was a lot of research momentum on unifying uh, those two frameworks. Um, and local quantum field theory was born out of the, the search of a formulation of quantum mechanics uh, that satisfied the principles of uh, special relativity or Lorentz invariance. Basically that, that the theory is local, doing things here shouldn't affect things there, at least not instantaneously. 
And what, lo what locality requires is that fundamentally, you have to work with fields. And with fields, this means you have a degree of freedom at every space-time point. The picture that comes out of this is that of particles that uh, propagate causally in space-time and interact uh, locally with other particles. And obviously, I don't need to oversell uh, the success of this framework to this audience. Um, this uh, small table here uh, gives you all the fundamental particles that were, uh, that were either descri well described by, by, by local quantum field theory or predicted by it. Given this success and this momentum, it was natural to expect that uh, the same framework can also encapsulate gravity. However, gravity doesn't appear to fit nicely uh, into this, uh, this framework, uh, most famously because as a quantum field theory, gravity is uh, what we, what we um, often term as non-renormalizable. Uh, interactions in a perturbative treatment of gravity are uh, so-called irrelevant, and hence they suffer from untamable divergences if you want to keep the theory predictive. Hence, the only way to define uh, a theory of gravity in this framework is by, is by putting a cutoff. So hence the theory is, uh, is at most an effective theory, an effective field theory that's valid only for uh, making low energy predictions. Um, but but then, so the interesting question you can ask is, could, could the UV completion of gravity just be a more elaborate local quantum field theory? That's a good question. Well, I believe the answer to that is no, um, because locality in some sense is part of the issue. In fact, this question of renormalizability only comes about uh, because, uh, because of locality and the, and the assumption that you have a continuum uh, at arbitrarily short distances. Um, more relevant to my talk, uh, what locality seems to predict is that if you consider any small region or any finite region in space, that the number of degrees of freedom is infinite. And we'll see shortly that gravity does not have this property. So the message basically is that gravity is different. And so let's go into why that is. The main reason that uh, makes gravity different is that it has black holes. And so uh, let's talk about black holes. If you look at the left diagram here, that uh, it's, it shows the process of black hole formation from stellar collapse. And note that this is a space-time diagram, so time goes upwards. Well, more or less, not exactly. Um, and what happens under this collapse is that at some point, this, the space-time gets uh, sufficiently warped um, by sort of the energy density of the star that it creates an event horizon, uh, the point of no return or the radius of no return, uh, behind which everything is doomed to crash into the singularity which is in the center in this picture. A more useful diagram for me is the one on the right. Uh, this, um, this is often called a conformal diagram, or if you finish drawing the picture, a, a Penrose diagram, in which light, uh, and the main feature of this diagram is that light goes along 45 degree lines. And um, given that the speed of light is a cosmic speed limit, um, this means that all allowed paths that you can draw in the space time cannot be angled more than 45 degrees. What this picture makes clear is that the inescapability of a black hole is due to the fact that the event horizon is a null surface. It is angled at 45 degrees, and the only way for you to escape is to go faster than the speed of light. And for example, if you look at this path here on the left, um, once you pass through the horizon, your light cone um, all allowed paths within the light cone point toward the singularity. Um, hence, uh, the reason why you crash into the singularity is, is uh, you know, people like to say gravity is so strong that you, you have to fall in that direction. But what actually happens is, is the singularity is, um, it's, it's sort of inevitable. It is, to your, it is to your inescapable future. Okay? So singularity is not, is not a point in space. Singularity is a point in time. It's not a point on that, it's the end of time. Um, back in 2020, in the midst of the COVID gloom, uh, uh, I'm sure many of us were very happy by uh, 
uh, Roger Penrose getting the, the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, for his contributions, uh, showing that well, proving a uh, necessary and sufficient condition for black hole formation, which is these um, for the formation of these trapped surfaces. Uh, basically, a measure showing that uh, that the space time is focused is beginning to focus, and uh, it's um, it's bound to cr to crunch into a singularity. Okay, you can ask uh, sort of how dense does the matter need to be in order to, in order to form a black hole, and the answer is sort of roughly speaking is that it needs to be squeezed uh, beyond its uh, so-called Schwarzschild radius. Uh, this is a radius that goes as uh, g newton times the mass of the of, of sort of center of mass energy of this process divided by the by the speed of light squared. Uh, for Earth, if you want to make, if you want to collapse Earth into a black hole. You can have to squeeze it down to roughly a centimeter. So there's no danger of that. Something interesting about black holes is that, is that they satisfy a set of uh, laws of thermodynamics. Okay? Um, but where the area of the event horizon plays the role of entropy, it satisfies a first law of thermodynamics uh, that relates the energy changes to changes in the area um, um, well, times this kappa over e pi. Kappa is the surface gravity, it's the force, it's the, it's the measure of the force of gravity at the horizon of, of a black hole. It's not important. The details are not important of kappa, of what kappa is. What is important is that this combination can be interpreted as T times dS. So dE equals TdS, that's the usual thermodynamic relation. We'll get into what, what the temperature is later. The area of the horizon also satisfies a second law of thermodynamics. So in, the, in, in standard thermodynamics, that's a statement that the entropy increases uh, under any uh, spontaneous process. In this case, it uh, means that the area of the horizon has to increase under any perturbation of the black hole, which follows from Hawking's uh, area theorem. Um, the further argument for why you should um, Think of the area as an entropy is due to an argument by Jacob Beckenstein, who, who asked the following question uh, What would happen to the entropy of the universe if, uh, if matter with some entropy falls behind the horizon of a black hole? Suppose we compare the entropy at T1 to the entropy at T2. Well, it looks like the entropy is decreasing. S out, uh, all this entropy uh, falls into the black hole. So it looks like the entropy of the universe has gone down, violating the second law. So that's the potential puzzle. Uh, however, this puzzle uh, disappears if you, if you think of the area as also contributing to the entropy of the universe, and hence changes, changes in the area compensate for the, for the decrease in the, in the matter entropy of the, the change in the matter entropy of the universe. And so what he proposes is that um, the second law is, is Going to be satisfied for um, not for the usual entropy, but for the generalized entropy, which is uh, it's equal to all the entropy outside, the matter entropy outside, plus the areas of all the horizons of black holes in the universe. And the statement of the second law would be that this generalized entropy is uh, positive semi definite. And this was proven in various cases by Aaron Wall. Um, so the upshot from this is that we need to assign the black hole an entropy, uh, which is proportional to the area of the horizon. And it turns out that the right normalization is just one over four G Newton. It's also just a happy accident that uh, DH here doesn't stand for black hole, stands, stands for Bekenstein Hawking. It's a happy accident that DH stands, but you can see it. Okay. You might still be skeptical and possibly suspect uh, maybe that we're just fooling ourselves, seeing things that aren't really there, and we're all suffering from a serious case of academic pareidolia. Uh, like this picture here, uh, in which some people might see some rock formation, but it's clearly a picture of an elephant. Okay. Um, to convince you uh, that it's an entropy, um, uh, we can derive it from standard thermodynamic. Uh, uh, well, there's a, there's, a, there's a derivation of it. 
using using the definition of entropy in statistical mechanics. Um, in thermodynamics or statistical, statistical mechanics, the, the 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 entropy is a is a measure of the size of space of, of the accessible phase space of a system. The way you compute it, uh, for example, here it's going to be like all the different configurations of uh, the molecules of the gas in the box. The way you compute it is you consider the partition function, the trace of e to the minus beta h, and then you apply this uh, operator on the log of z, and uh, and that gives you a thermal entropy, which again you're supposed to think of the log of the number of microstates in some sense. What we are after is uh, the derivation of the Bekenstein Hawking entropy, uh, and also for what for what these microstates are that are being counted by this entropy. Okay, what we know from quantum mechanics is that the trace of some Hamiltonian evolution uh, can be replaced or can be written as the, uh, can be expressed in terms of the Feynman path integral. Uh, here I'm being explicit in terms of the, the, the path integral over the metrics, but there's also the, the, path, uh, the remainder of the path integral over the matter that lives on uh, the metric G. Um, you can take that, well, um, what, I'm, what I'm going to talk about, the action of the, of the, of the of gravity is you can do the famous Einstein-Hilbert action. And uh, some just technical comments, uh, because, um, because the time evolution here is, is beta, not I beta. So it's, it's, uh, it's Euclidean time. Um, um, the, the, the manifold, the, well, the space time to, the space time that you consider in this integral are purely Euclidean space times. And what this trace here implies that you must have a periodicity in beta, okay? Which means you need to consider manifolds, uh, uh, which uh, at least at infinity, I'll say y at infinity in a second, that go to a cylinder, S1 times RD, RD is the remainder of the spatial dimensions. Uh, the technical reason for why considering this at infinity is because the Hamiltonian in a theory of, theory of gravity is the boundary term. So this, uh, this trace over the circle is happening at infinity. The, the gravity integral is hard to evaluate, uh, but uh, something that we all know uh, how to do for hard for difficult integrals is, is to just focus on, on, on a saddle point analysis. Okay. And so this is going to be the sum over various saddles of the gravity integral, and, the, and but there's a full uh, uh, path integral over the, of, of the matter on that geometry. Okay. Um, it turns out that the, that the relevant contribution for us will be just a single saddle point in the gravity integral, which is just a single uh, gravitational configuration. But again, the matter, uh, you're still tracing over all the matter states. The gra this gravity configuration, uh, or shown over here, it's known as the Euclidean cigar because this looks like a cigar, apparently. Okay. Um, now, and this space time has the right features that we were expecting. It has periodicity in the imaginary tau uh, direction. And the metric is this, and uh, the, the radius at where the space time caps off is some critical radius RS. Now, this metric is familiar to a lot of you, I'm sure. And the question is why consider the space time? Well, because it's a black hole. Uh, in some, in, uh, um, if you take the space time and uh, perform what is called an analy analytic continuation, uh, you, uh, you, you continue the time from the imaginary tau to, to real times t, you end up with the usual maximally extended eternal uh, short shield uh, black hole. And um, the geometry, well, the, the place where you do the analytic continuation about is this, uh, this slice of uh, reflection symmetry. And, and this, this blue line identifies with this blue line. And the, the tip of the cigar is the, is the intersection of the two horizons, sometimes called the bifurcate horizon. OK, whatever, that's the solution. You take the solution, you plug it into the action, then you compute the entropy. Just apply this operator on it. And what you find is area of the horizon over 4G Newton plus the matter entropy on one side. So this, this procedure computes for you 
the thermal entropy as, as, as sort of measured on one side uh, of this black hole. I should have said that this black hole is, uh, it has two asymptotic regions and, um, and also a black hole interior and a white hole interior. These details are not important. Sometimes this is called a wormhole connecting to universes. The, the, the point here is that we considered a single gravity configuration, yet we found uh, a large number, uh, a large gravitational contribution of the area of the horizon. We understand where this came from because we did the path integral, the, we summed over the phase space of the matter, but there was only a single gravity solution. So why did this number show up? Um, again, why? This is, this is, this is really deep. Um, and um, yeah, so we didn't see any, any sign of microstates. Yes, yet we understand from general thermodynamic reasoning that they should be there. What's really amazing um, is that uh, uh, you can consider this one of the triumphs or, or successes of string theory, which is a UV completion of gravity, is that you can account for these microstates in some special, in a special class of black holes. Um, and the reason is, is that in string theory, you have a knob of changing the, being able to change the coupling constant of the theory, which transitions you from a black hole to a stack of D-brains, or well, just some objects in string theory, in which you can do the counting easily, uh, free coupling, and then, uh, and the surprise that it matches exactly with the answer you get in the, at strong coupling using the gravitational description of just compute, of just, um, of just computing the area of the horizon of a black hole. Um, there's some supersymmetry involved here to make this work, but that's not important. Yes. Yeah. Just to give a sense of how big this contribution really is, um, you give it to you using the, the unit area of the denominator described by like, the unit of the square meters. Uh, yeah. Something like that. <laughs> so you have a black hole that's in kilometers. That's right. That's right. Yeah, if you look at this formula, the slide ago. Yeah. No, I'm a little confused. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say that uh, this completely dwarfs this term. That's the, I was going to make that point. Yeah, please. In the next slide, how do you take the, because what, what configuration of string theories? Did you use to compute the microstates in this? Well, uh, so it was not me, it was uh, some of the brother. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, there's um, these these brains in some low energy limit admit uh, admit a description in terms of a conformal field theory, and you you go through some Cardi like arguments uh, to well, there are constraints from conformal symmetry that uh, that uh, that uh, pin down the number of states of a uh, the, the density state of the system. And uh, so that, that's one way to. I guess what I'm curious about is that in the sort of Schwarzschild description, I mentioned, but uh, in the string theory description of the, of the black hole, is, you know it's a black hole when you're in the string theory side? Oh. The microstate side? It's like, it's like, no, this is literally just a stack of deep rings. It's just that some, some. How do you know what's the right stack of D-brains to take? Yeah, because you have this parameter GS, which when you tune from weak to strong, it looks it's it's the black hole that you were trying to measure the entropy of. So th this gives a, this gives a correspondence between all the different whichever configuration of D-brains you started with, they all look like this black hole that's strong coupling. And so the idea. They look like it in space time or in oh. respect, they look like. In space time, the, the, the solution that's strong coupling and low energy and so on is given by some supersymmetric black hole. All right. Um, so before that, let me emphasize that this is um, what's missing. What's really mysterious about this is that the black hole entropy again matches something uh, that depends sensitively, like this count here, depends sensitively on uh, the details. Of string theory, uh, which is maybe what you what you what you're getting at. This is um, like the reason why this is mind-boggling is that um, 
how, how on earth does this low energy description of gravity uh, anticipate the details of string theory? Like that's, that's, that's a question. I don't know the answer to that. And there are lots of different string theories, although maybe they're supposed to all be the same. Uh -huh. Well, here you consider this. So how do you know which one to take? Or is, there, is it the same no matter what string theory you're talking about? Um, here you imagine that you start with one of them and you do this match, at like weak coupling and strong coupling of that same string theory. Anyone, it doesn't matter which you start with. I don't know which cases in which this was uh, first done in, uh, uh, but yeah, you assume that you know which one you're, you're in. But now it's true for any string theory and we have to implement that. Uh, I imagine so, although I'm not an expert. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's the mystery. Um, and uh, yeah, so one last thing about the last slide is that it's very disturbing and you should, you should be disturbed too. Okay, so let's recap uh, what we saw so far. I, I argue that gravity is different because it has black holes. Uh, it gives you a thermal entropy that scales with area. Well, black holes have thermal entropy that scales with area and the gravity path integral assigns a thermal entropy but without microstates. Another thing that makes gravity different is that it's holographic. Here's a, a slice of a black hole that contains the interior. Uh, the prediction from the Bexton Hawking entropy is that, uh, um, is that the number of states of the system doesn't go as the volume of the interior, but it goes as the area of the event horizon. Um, this is to be contrasted with what you get from local quantum field theory, which would say it was the volume of the interior. And this motivated this uh, holographic principle that, uh, that any region in a gravitational system can be described by the degrees of freedom on its boundary. The most precise realization of this idea of holography is from gauge gravity duality, which comes from string theory, and which says that a gravitational theory in d plus one dimensions can be dual to a non-gravitational theory in one fewer dimension. This answers that, uh, um, uh, well, I think this difference in dimension is what guarantees the holographic nature of gravity. Volume scaling in the quantum field theory, which in this non-gravitational system, is like area scaling in gravity. Um, and the canonical example of this duality is known as area CFD. And it's a duality between a string theory inside of ADS, uh, inside of the space time called anti Sitter space, uh, which is a space time with an asymptotic boundary uh, and a, a conformal field theory, kind of quantum field theory with extended space time symmetries. Um, that uh, lives on the boundary of ADS. As a point of terminology, I'm going to call the, the, the theory inside, well, the ADS gravity theory as the bulk, because it's inside the cylinder, and the CFT theory as the boundary, because it's, well, it lives on the boundary. The utility of this uh, duality is that it's a strong, weak duality. Uh, the coupling constant in the, in the bulk theory, roughly speaking, is just G Newton. While the coupling constant, uh, and it's related to the coupling constant of the QFT uh, in an inverse way, it goes as one over GN mil squared, and also times the N, times N squared, where N is uh, it's the size of the gauge group, or roughly speaking, the number of uh, different fields you have. Hence, if you want to compute like a, like a scattering in CFT, a four point function, um, this is a, well, this, uh, say you want to compute it at strong coupling. This is a, a horrendous calculation, um, but it translates into the book as two, you know, two freely streaming particles in ADS that might exchange a graviton or two. Okay, so it gives you that advantage. The simplest example of this duality comes actually not from string theory, but from condensed matter. Uh, back in 2014, uh, Joe Polchinski and I were trying to understand the simplest possible example of ADS CFT. So we focus on the case of ADS2, one plus one, CFT zero plus one, which, which is just conformal quantum mechanics when we have time. The issue is that by conformal symmetry and this dimensional, dimensional analysis, the only thing you can write down for the density of states is, is, a, is a delta function plus one over E. Um, the thing that we um, showed is that in two dimensions, that th this conformal symmetry is a lie. Gravitational back reaction is, uh, or gravitational effects, back reaction is, 
uh, is very strong in two dimensions and it breaks the, uh, the, the, the conformal symmetry. One sort of like uh, hand wavy reason for why gravity is strong in two dimensions, well, you only have one space dimension. It doesn't, it doesn't dissipate. You don't have the one of our squared law and so on. Um, the thing that's exciting about this is, um, is that it was that our results were later confirmed by the discovery of the, of the uh, SYK model, where Alexei Kitayev showed that ADS2 physics um, uh, emerges out of the low energy uh, physics of this very simple down to earth model involving just, just fermions, just, just Majorana fermions. Um, or just spins, if you will. And so this model has n Majorana fermions, where uh, all the fermions talk, or every fermion talks to every other fermion, using a Hamiltonian that couples four at a time. You can consider four or six, eight, it doesn't matter. Um, the, the, something interesting about this model, well, uh, some more mechanics of the model, is that these couplings, J, I, J, K, are drawn from some Gaussian ensemble with zero mean and some variance J squared. Um, and uh, so the, now the idea is that you have the Marana fermions, which you can think of as just n over two spins, which live on the boundary of ADS and they're dual to some ADS two space time. The duality is not exact. First, it's only true at low energies. And there, there are some extra fields in the, in the bulk. Um, it's not, it's, well, there's that caveat. Yet there's a lot of physics of this SYK model that is captured by gravi gravitational physics in one plus one dimension. And um, something, some, something interesting about this model and really came sort of right out, right out of left field is that, um, is that the gravity emerges after doing a disorder average. So this kind of raises the question that maybe holographic duality, although this is contrast to the previous slide, uh, the gravity is dual possibly not to a single quantum mechanical system on the boundary, but rather an ensemble of quantum mechanical systems. Um, and that point sort of was, was, the, was the launching pad of the, uh, uh, another series of works connecting gravity to random matrix theory, which really deserves a colloquium uh, all by itself. Uh, the thing I want to highlight about uh, holography are some interesting properties of the dictionary between the bulk and the boundary. Namely, uh, how, how is boundary fine grain entropy uh, measured in the bulk? And um, so far I've been phrasing the duality as a duality between the entire CFT and the entire bulk. The question is whether there's a subsystem version. If I know part of the boundary, how much of the bulk can I reconstruct? Let me be begin with fine grain entropy with a very quick recap of what, of what entropy is. And by that, I mean what, by what fine grain entropy is. I, I will sort of interchangeably use uh, fine grain entropy, entanglement entropy, or von Neumann entropy. The simplest case is just two entangled spins. We all saw that in kindergarten. Uh, so if two spins, I'll represent the entanglement between them as some dotted line. So it's a superposition of zero zero plus one one. The way you compute entropy of, let's say, the entanglement entropy of, say, one of the spins is that you construct the density matrix, you trace out one of the spins, you get the matrix. And then um, to compute the entropy, you plug it into this scary formula, trace row log row, and you get log two. This number is actually the maximum von Neumann entropy that you can, that you can get from, for one qubit. The reason being is that uh, uh, log two is the maximum, maximum amount of uncertainty you can have about a two level system. If you have n qubits, then the maximum is n log two. But sometimes you're not interested in the precise value of the entropy. You just want to know if the state is pure or not. For that, there's a uh, quick and uh, dirty way to do it, which is to compute something called the purity, trace row squared. And if it's not equal to one, which in this case it's not, then you know that the density matrix is mixed. It has some non zero von Neumann entropy. And I'll just brief recap. And entanglement entropy is, uh, well, entanglement is important for many reasons. Uh, one, you know, it's important for fun teleportation. Uh, it's been used uh, somewhat recently in, as an order parameter for classifying phases of matter. Uh, it plays a key role in the speed ups that you get from, uh, that are promised 
uh, from quantum computers, and it's important in quantum gravity. So let's talk about von Neumann entropies. Uh, here of uh, subregions of the CFP. Say I give you a subregion R and I want to compute the entropy. The proposal due to Mutakanagi is a very simple geometric one where you consider all possible surfaces that start from one endpoint of R and end on the other. These are co-dimension two surfaces in the bowl. And the entropy is given by the uh, by the um, by the area of the minimal area surface. You minimize over the area. Um, this, minimize, this, uh, this description is actually a special case. The more general case uh, or the more general formula is the following, uh, a bit scary, but let's, let's go through it. What you have to do is um, instead of just considering the area, you have to consider the generalized entropy. So it's not just the area of the surface, but the area plus the von Neumann entropy uh, of the bulk matter contained within R and the surface X. That's the generalized entropy. You extremize it, meaning you have to find the surface where first order variation are zero. In the event that you have multiple uh, extremal, uh, extremal surfaces that extremize is functional, you take the one with, with the smallest value of the generalized entropy. Yes. So when you say bulk entropy, uh, bulk matter, perhaps like gas or gravitas is part of matter in this language, or? I refuse to answer questions about gravity. <laughs> um, it, it, um, the, I think the subtlety about gravitons. Um, um, so if your gas, if your gas of gravitons is here, that the deep in the, like the uh, in this in this in this wedge region, then I would say it, you consider you consider it as a contribution to the matter entropy. And by gas, you mean it means the gas of electron uh, gravitons in a mixed state. I, I imagine you have that in mind. Uh, yeah, then, then it would contribute. Um, there are subtleties about, about uh, the contributions of gravitons coming from the entangling surface from, from this point here. There's a UV divergence. And there, there, there are subtleties about sort of gauge invariance, about how you, how you split the space down here in a theory that uh, is non local like gravity. So that's the best answer I can give you. Okay. Um, an interesting case to apply this formula is, uh, is in the thermal state. So in the thermal state, we, well, we argued before that, the, that the, indirectly that a thermal state is due to one half of an eternal black hole. In, ADA, in, uh, in, in the ADS space time, it's one half of the eternal uh, ADS Schwarzschild black hole. So that's, that's what this density matrix is. You can ask, what is the, what is the dual to the whole thing? If I give you the, the, the maximum extended ADS Schwarzschild black hole, what is the boundary dual of that? Well, it's going to have to be the purification of this thing. It is by symmetry, it's going to have to be this particular purification, sometimes called the canonical purification, uh, and uh, it's called the thermal field double state. Um, if you look at, uh, um, suppose we want to compute the entropy of the entire right boundary. So, so this is an entangled state between the left and the right. And I want, to, I want to measure how much entanglement I have. Uh, and I want to use the bulk. So, so I want to compute the entropy of R. I apply this formula. And I look for the surfaces that extremize as functional. And you land on exactly the bifurcate horizon. So the answer that you get is the area of the horizon plus the matter outside to one side of, uh, of uh, the space time. And so the, the, this is the same answer that we saw before. So this is a, a, an alternative, it's a, an alternative uh, derivation of the Bekenstein Hawking entropy and also has a different interpretation. Um, this is the starting point of, uh, I'm sure you've heard about this mantra of uh, uh, wormholes and entanglement and ER to ZPR. Uh, it, was, it was because of this observation. The other thing I wanted to cover is bulk reconstruction and subregion duality. Basically the answer to the question of how much of the bulk can you reconstruct within a subregion. Um, and long story short, uh, the answer to that question uh, uh, turns out to be that given R, you can reconstruct everything 
up to the extremal surface X. Okay, so that's this, this shaded region here, sigma X on. And um, uh, it's not just that region, but you also have to consider the causal development. So that, that carves out a wedge uh, uh, to also include time. And hence it's called the entanglement wedge. The real intuition behind this is that since the entropy of R is sensitive to the entropy of the matter in this region, clearly R knows about the matter in this region. That's a very quick hand wavy argument for why I should expect that this is dual to R. Something interesting uh, out of this um, proposal is that it suggests that there's a redundancy in, uh, in the bulk to boundary map. In particular, you can consider um, uh, entanglement wedges of different regions um, that overlap. We so have split the boundary to A, B, and C. And uh, yeah, so they, they overlap. And hence, if you have a spin, some, some object some, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the center of ABS, um, then you would say that that spin, well, if it belongs to the overlap of the entanglement wedges, then you would say that, that spin should be, um, its information is encoded in either AC, BC, or AB. Okay? Just the fact that it belongs to the entanglement wedges of any one of those three composite regions. A more formal statement from quantum information is that um, uh, is to use sort of the oldest trick uh, uh, in, in quantum information, which is to track is, is um, you track information by introducing a reference system that you entangle with your system of interest, um, um, which is here the cube in the ball, and ask which of the boundary subregions uh, is correlated with the reference. If there's no correlation, correlation with the reference, then clearly that region knows nothing about the spin. And so you compute using the formulae that we saw in the, on the previous slide, you find that the mutual information between uh, say any one of these systems individually and, and the reference is zero. Hence they all, this is a quantum information term, they decouple from the reference, density matrix factorizes. Yet the, 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 the mutual information between any, any two of these regions and the reference is two log two. They know everything about the spin. You can prove that because this is true, there exists a unitary on just BC that can decode the state of the spin. Again, this by acting on, let's say, BC by itself. Right, just yes. to make sure I understand, you're saying the, the wedge corresponding to A, B, or C can fall because the groups that we have been looking at here is that the wedge should be zero. Yes. But if you get the union of two of these regions, then that wedge, which will be drawn here, that would include the spin. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. B knows nothing about the spin because its wedge is here. AC knows about it. Now, the thing that we, um, um, Don Harlow and I, we noticed this uh, back in 2015, and we, um, uh, we made the argument that this is reminiscent of quantum error correction. A quantum error correction is a crucial ingredient of uh, building scalable, fault tolerant. Uh, quantum computers. The main challenge in building quantum computers is that qubits are uh, susceptible to decoherence by interacting with the environment. Um, and, in quantum, and quantum error correction is this ingenious way of building in uh, redundancy in, in your system in order to preserve the important part of the wave function from corruption. So sort of a toy example is uh, the problem I'm going to call here the uh, random erasure code. To protect the state, say, of one to qubit psi, you introduce uh, a collection for an additional set of fiducial qubits. And then you act with a, a, rand, a, uh, a random unitary, okay, which I'm going to call the encoding unitary. That produces for you some horrible state of the output qubit. And the state of psi is now delocalized and it's, it's everywhere. Um, but you can show um, that you can decode the state psi from any subset of the qubits that's more than half, plus a few more, just to be, just to be sure. Um, um, so you can decode psi, uh, and the remainder is just some junk you don't care about. 
Um, but what this shows is that um, you allow for some, it's, there's, some um, there's some tolerance for corruption. So uh, some of these qubits can be corrupted, yet you can still recover uh, the state uh, side. And just the analogy between here and the, and the previous slide is that this, this encoding map between this side and this side, roughly speaking, is like the, the holographic map from the bulk onto the boundary. It's some encoding of the, of the information. Um, so differently, let's apply this back again. The statement is that the spin here is protected against the erasure of A because you can recover it purely from VC. This gives a new interpretation for um, the, this holographic dimension in the bulk, the radial dimension, which is not present in the CFD. The interpretation of it is that it's a measure of it's a measure of protection of the information in the CFT. Somehow, things in the CFT that are dual to things deeper in the bulk are more well protected. And since then, there's been an industry of constructing uh, um, uh, quantum error correcting codes that mimic features of ADS CFT, and they all sort of generally belong to a class. Uh, called um, uh, tensor networks. That looks something like this uh, to represent the code that maps the bulk into the boundary. Okay. So, I mean, one thing about ADS-CFT is that in ADS, there's an hyperbolic space and almost all of its volume is just the fact of information. So it's in here, there's a lot of things to know. That's right. So, I have to teach the other example you did before you made it Essentially, in the right. here, though, if you want to use the boundary as your permission for it, you can give it up. That's right, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, gravity has different motivations than when else. So I, it didn't have to be that this, that this is useful. Right, okay, so you're not saying this is a practical error. No, no. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And that, and that, you know, sometimes we, a lot of the times we make progress when we borrow ideas from, from elsewhere. And so this makes that connection between quantum information and gravity. And uh, there are other cases where it doesn't suffer from this infinity that you're talking about, where the quantum information ideas help, um, uh, which I think I'll, I'll touch on later. Um, okay, so so by now we can safely say that in some sense gravity is normal. Uh, what I mean is that it's it, as gravitational physics has to be consistent with uh, with quantum mechanics. Otherwise, it would be completely bizarre that everything I told you uh, is true. Um, but you know, perhaps there's no reason to be uh, dogmatic about this. Um, actually, there is. So let me talk about the central dogma of black holes. Uh, if you would all turn to uh, the book of Juan, um, um, it says that as seen from the outside, a, a, uh, a black hole behaves as a standard quantum system. Um, and it's one that has area over 4G Newton, many degrees of freedom, like qubits, you, uh, if you want, um, which, which just says that, uh, well, it's finite. Black hole is a finite system, and it evolves unitarily under time evolution. Now let's see if this actually holds. Let me start. That's some isolated black hole that can't have something fall in on it. Uh, good. So yes, good point. But if it's interacting with something else, uh, it should be under. It should evolve under um, like uh, uh, well, unitary time evolution of the entire system. That's going to be important for what I'm going to say. So let me start with a uh, quick thermodynamic puzzle. Imagine that we have two extremely large boxes. Okay? And in one box, we have a small black hole, some mass M. And in the other box, we have um, uh, a gas of particles uh, with the same total mass. Um, you can convince yourself that, you, that uh, in the large volume limit, 
that the entropy of the gas is actually much larger than the entropy of, of just a black hole by itself. So this area, this goes with the volume, roughly speaking. Um, hence, the black hole phase is thermodynamically disfavored. Um, so there must be a process, or if black holes are normal systems, there must be a process that takes this phase to this phase. Uh, sorry. Classically, there is not. We saw from Hawking's area theorem that entropy, that, sorry, that the area of the black hole only increases. But quantum mechanically, there is. There's Hawking radiation. The quantum mechanics comes in to save the day. And uh, this is the famous uh, pair creation process of entangled particles uh, that straddle the horizon, where the outside modes uh, escape. Uh, well, they uh, they uh, um, they 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 fly away from the black hole. They carry positive energy with them, while the um, and they're entangled with these interior particles that carry negative energy, uh, as measured by the Hamiltonian of infinity. This is detail. And hence, they, uh, they, they decrease the mass of the black hole and make it shrink. So the picture you have is, um, uh, is a black hole that slowly transforms into just a gas of, uh, of outgoing Hawking particles. Um, and the last point here is that uh, the origin of these entangled states, uh, it's, it's, it's basically just a, it's a you assume you have vacuum at the horizon, you have empty space at the horizon, and you can show that, that the vacuum uh, has, uh, can be expressed in a different basis as an entangled set of particles. This is the usual statement in, in, in quantum field theory that the vacuum is highly entangled. Um, and this temperature, well, sorry, this, way, this uh, evaporation process happens with the temperature, the same temperature that we saw in the thermodynamic relation. And it's worth to, to sort of go through, go, go through this. It's, uh, it, it sort of represents a unification of the many different areas of physics, including quantum mechanics, oops, including quantum mechanics, special relativity, statistical mechanics, general relativity, and circles. <laughs> okay. So, so we saw one problem, and we solved quickly by quantum mechanics. But now let me give you a list of other problems. First problem I'm going to go through now is what I'm going to call the information loss problem. Imagine throwing a letter into the black hole. Um, the, um, it appears to be that there, there is no mechanism that would imprint the information of the contents of the letter onto the emerging Hawking radiation. This, this pair creation process happened at the horizon doesn't really know about things that fell in, say, in the past. And this is not how standard, you don't, you don't expect this from standard quantum mechanics. So, so it seems like for the person outside, the information about the letter just disappears. You just have gas that knows nothing about the, the letter. And in standard quantum mechanics, information has to be retained. If you burn a letter, you should be able to reconstruct the words on the letter just from collecting the light and also the ash. Okay, what's awkward about this problem is that if you assume that it's not there, you run into a different problem. So that was information lost, now you have information surplus. Um, suppose that the information of the letter comes up. So the letter went in, and let's say that the letter, the information about the letter is in, in some collection of Hawking modes. It would appear that, in, that, in, that an infalling observer who can collect this information, they can continue to fall in and then meet the original copy of the information. So it looks like uh, there's observable quantum cloning. And we know that that's not allowed in quantum mechanics. Okay, um, the third problem is a bit more technical, which is that the, uh, um, the black hole can get overfilled and it's um, in, uh, During the evaporation process, um, the, um, the entanglement entropy between the outside Hawking modes and the black hole uh, increases uh, uh, monotonically with time. This is Hawking's famous 
uh, calculation of the entropy of the radiation. So that's, that's the red line. The blue curve here is the Bekenstein Hawking of Bekenstein Hawking entropy of the black hole, which is a stand in for the number of degrees of freedom uh, of the black hole. Remember our, our central dogma. Uh, we run into a paradox once these two lines cross, because it says that, uh, well, if you take this answer literally, it would say that the entanglement between the black hole and the radiation is much more, um, is much more than uh, what the black hole has room for. It's a small system could be made up of, you, know, you can wait all the way down here where, where the black hole is essentially gone. Yet blocking radiation has large entropy and it appears to be purified by this black hole. That's, that's, the, that's the paradox. Okay, so the black hole gets overfilled and, and if the black hole just disappears altogether and suppose you form the black hole in the pure state, it would appear you have evolution from a pure state to a mixed state. And that's contrary to unitary evolution. What you expect from a normal quantum system is that the Volmanian entropy can start uh, by increasing, but then once it hits the, um, uh, the, the bottleneck being the size of, of any one of the two systems, it has to start following the, uh, the size of the smaller system and has to decrease as the black hole uh, shrinks. This is known as the page curve and the time at which it turns around is known as the page time. This is what, what, what we are aiming for. The fourth problem and uh, promise is, this is the last one, is the firewall paradox. Um, uh, just, just like what we did again, let's assume that the, that, the, that the problem is resolved and then we run into another problem. So let's suppose that the entropy decreases. But let's say we're in, we're in so like this stage of the black hole um, evaporation and the entropy is supposed to decrease. So let's assume that. Well, if the entropy is decreasing, then the, these late Hawking modes that are coming out cannot be entangled with, sorry, the, the outgoing Hawking mode cannot be entangled with its interior partner. Because if it's entangled with the interior partner, you only increase the entanglement between the radiation and the black hole. And so, you need to break this entanglement. It needs to be entangled with the early radiation for the entropy to go down. Um, but if you break this entanglement, that means you don't have vacuum at the horizon anymore. And uh, we, I mean, we don't have any definite proposals for what actually happens, but it seems like, uh, but, uh, well, it seems like you, you might crash into sort of a, 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 a um, into like a shock wave of, of like Planckian energy and so on. So we call this um, uh, the firewall and its existence is, uh, well, it puts into doubt uh, uh, the very existence of the black hole interior. Okay, so given all this, I wouldn't blame you if your confidence in the statement is somewhat shaken. Uh, so it does start with the question marks now. It really does appear to be a tall order for gravity and that perhaps uh, that maybe gravity can't solve it. And we need, a, we need to look into string theory or, uh, uh, or just a, a UV completion of gravity in order to answer these questions. So this, yes. So this problem with the firewall will derive from um, um, There are various versions of the firewall paradox. Um, uh, this is the one that requires being out in the page time, but there are, there are others about uh, what a typical black hole microstate should look like. So maybe that's not, is that where we're getting at? I was just asking that. Okay. You know, firewalls in particular, maybe there aren't any black hole holes. Oh, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't say that any of the actually, the actual black holes that we see out there are anywhere near being at the page time. Um, uh, um, but I'm not a big fan of that argument. I mean, there's still a question that you can set up and, and, and see what happens. Um, um, yeah. Is it possible that the majority of black holes in the early universe are there without the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. 
they're non, they're non, well, I guess it's hard to say. Uh, we don't know, none of the black holes that we've observed can we, can we provide a strong argument to say that it's past the page time. And I think Mark's point is a good one that there might not have been either. We don't have any compelling evidence there were. Mm -hmm. People actually have to just sit on their books and look. Well, but we're trying to we're trying to construct a consistent set of rules for to, to describe gravity, and hence, well, the way you do that is you consider the most awkward situation, like this one. Um, okay, uh, just like in all good stories, the hero swoops in in the last minute to save the day. Uh, we'll see that gravity does this in an unreasonably smart way. I'm going to try to be quick here. I'll tell you the answer before telling you the how. I think that's time. So um, it turns out that the problem that we, uh, well, all four problems follow from using the wrong formula for computing the entropy. In a theory of gravity, uh, the entropy should be computed using uh, the, uh, what I'm calling the gravitational fine grain entropy formula, analogous to the one that we saw in application of uh, ADS CFD. And what it says is that when you, uh, when you compute the entropy of the radiation, yes, one contribution is Hawking's original calculation of just taking the radiation outside and construct the density matrix and uh, do the trace rule as well. Um, but, it could be, but it can also be, um, um, it, it can also get a contribution from not just the entropy of the outside, but the union of the, of the outside radiation and a region behind the black hole, which I'm calling the island. So it's the, it's the entropy of the union of the radiation of the island, plus the area of the boundary of the island. Okay. Um, what this formula says is that uh, uh, the actual entropy of the radiation is the minimum between this contribution and this contribution. There could be others, but we don't, it's not relevant for our, our, uh, our set of here. Hey, I'm sorry, I, where did the island come from? I mean, what is it? Yeah, so far I'm just saying that um, there is, a, that this is the right formula. We're, I'm proposing a new formula for computing the entropy. The prescription for this formula says that uh, you have to take the minimum of various different contributions. Okay? One contribution is Hawking answer. A different contribution, is where uh, you evaluate the generalized entropy of the union of the radiation region plus a new region in, inside the black hole. So you just hypothesize there's some special spot of oh. the island. So, 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 so the first, the first, the first point is that you should consider regions behind the. You should consider these spots or these regions behind the black hole. What fixes it for you? The thing that fixes it is is uh, the extremization procedure. Given the, this region, this uh, radiation region, you consider the generalized entropy over all islands, and you pick the one that extremizes the, the generalized entropy. Go ahead. Okay, I can finish in five minutes. Okay. Um, so, if you take the minimum, uh, well, if you take that formula and take the minimum between these two contributions, you get the page rate. Why? Yeah, the Hawking answer goes up. This answer, it turns out that the main contribution comes from the area of the boundary of the island, which is near the horizon. Hence, it decreases with time. And so the minimum of those two goes up and comes back down. So this solves problem three and four. We have a page curve without firewalls. The other problem, what about the information that was lodged deep inside uh, the black hole? How, how do we get it out? Well, you, you, um, uh, the idea is to use entanglement wedge reconstruction. Entanglement wedge reconstruction follows from the entropy formula that I, that I flashed on the previous slide. And what it says is that the island should be thought of as being a subsystem of the radiation. It's not an independent entity from the radiation, at least past the page time. So what this means is that there's a, there's a there's a decoding unitary that you can act on the radiation and it can extract the spin from the black hole. After you do this, the, the spin is no longer inside the, 
the black hole. And so it gives you this nice picture where the way the information escapes is not by uh, seeing it very clearly in the radiation, although it's there in some way, but um, uh, it escapes by simply falling deeper into the black hole and entering the entanglement wedge of the radiation. Um, again, the, the, the fact that uh, the fact that, uh, that the information, the way that you check that the information is, is inside the radiation is that there's, there's a different thing that I can't, that I don't have time to talk about. There's, a, there's, a, there's an explicit decoding procedure that shows you how information inside the black hole can be extracted by operations purely acting on the radiation. Um, and so this solves problems one and two. Very quickly about the how. Um, let me, um, it's gonna involve the gravity path integral and I'm gonna do it using an abstract version of, an, of a fully evaporated black hole. I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume that this, this is a picture of that. The outside universe is this, this vertical line here and this, this, this closed universe that branches off that's like the interior of the black hole. And there's a lot of entanglement between a particle in the interior and a particle in the outside. So this is a, this is this is an abstraction. Let me abstract the abstraction. Okay? So this picture is supposed to represent this. And the statement is that there's a lot of entanglement between the outside and the inside. That's represented by this blue line. The entanglement is of order k. And uh, the so let's compute the purity. Just check that the radiation outside is pure or mixed. Well, to compute the purity, you first compute the density matrix of the outside. You trace out over the interior. Tracing out in the theory of, theory of gravity means you put in a, you, you connect using the gravity path integral. That's what this bubble is. Now to compute the purity, which is trace rule squared, well, there's matrix multiplication between the two density matrices, and you have two factors of the gravity path integral. The rules in gravity is you allow all possible connections. One possible connection is this point to this point and this point to that point, which, which gives you this. This in some sense is like the naive thing that you, you might have thought to do. And in fact, this, this gives you Hawking's answer. But there's another connection where the, the, the cat of one row connects to the bra of the other row. That gives you something like this, which you, you can rearrange to give you that. And then the trace of row squared is equal to this Hawking contribution, which goes as one over K plus trace row all squared. But that's just one. So the answer for trace row squared is one plus one over k in the large k limit. We get uh, we get that the uh, state of the radiation is pure. This is a quick and dirty uh, uh, way of explaining the how. Um, and here is a competition between two terms. This is like the competition between the two different contributions in the, in the previous slides in computing the entropy. There was the Hawking entropy, and there was the there was the entropy, including the island. Okay, so let me quickly conclude. So we saw that, gravita that, that the gravitational path integral has the right structure uh, for unitary physics. Um, uh, the results that we got are similar to the derivation of the Bekstein Hawking entropy uh, formula. And they, as in, we got entropy without microstates. We don't know why this worked. Um, um, we don't know why gravity knows about this. It's very mysterious. Um, uh, so there's still something deep to be understood. And one final slide, let me just advertise something. So over the past two years, uh, most people, maybe including you, were busy learning how to bake. Um, I was working on uh, editing my late advisor's uh, memoirs, uh, Memories of a Theoretical Physicist, which is uh, gonna be published uh, in, in, in MIT Press sometime next year. And uh, um, it, it's a wonderful read and I'm sure all of you would have, uh, well, there, there's something in it for everyone. And so with that, thank you very much. We have a lot of questions for you. So your answer to the power was, 
how like how the information gets recovered. It doesn't even make sense because the information was referenced in Lorentzian, which you put the letters of this tension is called out of there. Um not completely obvious to me that it's uh, because of tension causality because in the connections you can go. So let me give two classes. So the first is that uh, um, you can have a purely Lorentzian problem as in compute the entropy as a function of time, and the contributions that fix the fix that answer. Uh, uh, I mean, they do come from the, the gravitational, the, sorry, the Euclidean section of the solution. Um, so you didn't have to consider purely static situations. So even with time dependence, the Euclidean, uh, Euclidean gravity plays a role. You can ask a different question, which is, well, is there an independent purely Lorentzian uh, setup? And there, the, the rules aren't that clear. Um, 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 Although I, I, I don't have an answer either way. But some people like this in Santa Barbara like this. They have papers of proposing for how these connections would happen. Yet uh, I think the, part, the state of the art right now is that they understand it for a theory of just gravity without matter. So that's for me to say it's a work in progress. Yes. Is there some sort of physical interpretation of the island? I mean, it seems like it's almost, it's like, almost like you're discovering additional structure in black holes. Well, I mean, we're not changing uh, the, what a black hole looks like from, from, people, the from the outside and also from the inside. But what we're saying is that there's some hidden non-locality in the problem. There's, there's all this entanglement between the black hole and the radiation. Um, tells you that uh, you can access the interior from the outside. Yes, after you do something to the radiation, by doing something complicated to the radiation, you certainly can change what the black hole looks like. But prior to doing anything of that sort, it's still the same, it's still the same space time. I guess what confuses me is absent some physical thing associated with island, how can, how can you know that's the right formula? I mean, why, why did it come out but that's what you should do. It's true, it solves all these kind of consistency problems, but it doesn't seem like, I feel like there should be more of a physical um, motivation somehow. Yeah, so, so first let me agree with you, it's very frustrating. But let me just also emphasize that it does come out of the gravity path integral. So you, know, you, if you define your theory in terms of the gravity path integral and you compute these entropies and you consider all possible. Like, well, in this case, it just it amazingly just comes out of saddle point analysis of the gravity pattern. And, and remembering that other connection that you're exactly. I think. It's essentially, essentially, it's a statement that you shouldn't, um, you shouldn't prematurely connect these lines. Yes. You have to wait until you compute a number. That row is a, is a matrix. And uh, um, if, you, if you trace, in some sense, hopefully speaking, when you trace over, uh, when you consider just a single connection, you throw away all of the off diagonal elements of the density matrix. Basically, just the calculation is wrong. Yeah, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a lowly postdoc. I can't say mocking you the wrong calculation. <laughs> yes. So, when you twist the cells and the break before it becomes two dimensions, and I, I do believe that the island formula should hold, I mean, conceptually, it's more like matrix. I mean, that's what I imagine. But for example, but the, the problem I'm concerned, I mean, JT seems to be well to this ensemble theory. What makes JT so unique? Or maybe we have to explain that ADS T should be not considered in the normal way that we have only one boundary. What's what the experts say about how to understand the ADSFT in four right dimensions? Or is JT so unique? Um, um, okay, let me say a few things. The first point is that these results um, have been also recovered in high dimensional contexts. In the case, it's, it's kind of a contrived case where you imagine that you have a uh, black hole where the matter is holographic. So there's this uh, holography within holography. Um, well, yeah, anyway, so, so in, in that setting, uh, basically it's been checked in any case where we know how to compute the matter entropy. 
matter, the volume entropy of matter is a hard thing to calculate. In two dimensions, it's easy. In higher dimensions, if, it's, if you have a holographic theory, then it's easy because we have formulas. Um, in that context, it's been confirmed. Well, it's been uh, found as well. Um, regarding JT gravity, um, um, yes. Uh, uh, and I would say it's, just, it's, it's definitely still a work in progress. It does look like JT gravity really is the average of, uh, of uh, an ensemble rather than a, a given theory. But, but we know, but well, the strongest argument for why it's special is because we know in higher dimensions, maybe a star class S5 is definitely just dual to n equals, n equals four super n mills, and it's, it has so many tests and so on. So that, that's only uh, what I can say. <laughs> I did also hold up. Um, so this would be applicable to primordial vectors to take this and not practice this question for us. Supposing they existed, is it conceivable there could be TP violation so that you could use this for adjusting the variant of symmetry? I mean, it seems like the answer would be no, that how could you possibly have TP violation repetition? I just wondered if. If that was, is there some theorem that says it couldn't happen? Um, not that I know, although I'm not sure if this is completely connected, but similar techniques you can show, predict that you can't have like global symmetries in the theory of gravity. This is not completely connected, but uh, um, um, uh, the, the basic statement is that, uh, like, say, um, okay, this is going to be very quick. So you have a state with one charge of a, of, a, of a global symmetry and a state with another charge. Right? Now you believe you just take the overlap, you get zero. Um, but if you consider the overlap squared, then what, what these techniques can, can give for you is that you can have a wormhole that connects the, the space down here to the space down here and hence contracts the, the states of equal charges. And so, and so um, basically the overlap squared could be non-zero. And so it tells you that uh, these wormholes, um, well, they provide the mechanism or at least a mechanism for, for breaking global symmetries uh, uh, in the theory of gravity. Having a, a systematic preference for one side of the breaking would seem like that would be the problem. Yeah, a little yeah. bit of background fluctuation, but how to amplify that. Yeah, it's not. Okay, well, thanks very much. Anna.